study in the book of Judges, because it is today in chapter 21. And the people came to the house of God and the woods there feel easy before God was lifted up their voices and wept sore and said, O Lord God of Israel, why is this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe missing in Israel? Richard Reeves writes a column that appears from time to time in our local newspaper. He recently described a trip to Europe. He and his wife visited a military cemetery in France where 6,000 American soldiers and more lie buried. It was an extraordinarily beautiful cemetery located in a picturesque setting and splendidly maintained. But it struck Reeves as strange that they were the only visitors there that day. And he remarked, you would think that their grandchildren would at least come and pay their respects. To which his wife replied, but they had no grandchildren. That's what war is about. He had forgotten that. Most of those soldier boys had no chance for a family of their own. They lost not only their own lives, but countless lives and generations to come. And something very much like that takes place in the Bible story before us today. Now at the time, when men's passions were stirred to a white heat, and the war trumpets were sounding on both sides of the field, and the fighting men were locked in the struggle for survival in the smoke and heat of battle, and the enemy ranks finally broke and victory was assured. They did not think then, how could they? What was happening to them? And what it would cost them for the future? Civil war had broken out in Israel. Looking back, you can see that it was bound to come like our civil war, over the issue of slavery. The battle lines were clearly drawn. The assembled armies of Israel on one side and the fighting men of Benjamin on the other. Like our civil war, it proved to be more bitter and costly than any war ever fought beyond our bar borders. For it pitted American against American and brother against brother, and here, Israelite against Israelite. A horrible crime had been committed at the city of Gibeah, a crime of sexual perversion, of homosexual savagery, and the sadistic torture and murder of an innocent woman. And everywhere that word carried, men and women were angered and outraged. It wasn't that such things happened. It was that the citizens of Gibeah saw no wrong, felt no shame, believed that their behavior was their own business and nobody else's. The Benjamites were called upon to surrender the criminals for punishment, but they refused. Was it out of a false sense of family loyalty, tribal togetherness? Now the two sides were to go to war. And like our civil war, the outcome was probably predictable 
to any observer on the outside. The industrialized north against the ill-equipped south. Here, the armies of Israel, 400,000 strong, against Benjamin with a mere 26,000 warriors. But they did not count on the intensity of the struggle or the fierceness of the fighting. Two times in a row, the vastly superior forces of Israel were severely beaten. And a tremendous loss in human life, casualties, body count, staggering even by today's standards. When finally the tide of battle turned, it carried and swept along with a terrible vengeance and carried far beyond the field of battle. The armies of Israel overran the tribal inheritance of Benjamin, destroying everyone and everything. Women, children, civilians, livestock, thousands falling and thousands more. And every village and city was burned down to the ground. And of that once proud tribe of Benjamin, only 600 soldiers escaped, ran to the desert, made their camp at the Rock of Rim. Like Sherman's march to the sea, with his scorched earth policy, a wide swath of destruction, so the armies of Israel destroyed their brothers in Benjamin. But logic would not explain to you what happened next. The elders of Israel returned to the house of God at Bethel. There they sat themselves down all the day long with bitter sorrow and with weeping. O oh Lord God of Israel, we hear them say, what has happened to us? Why is there one tribe in today missing in Israel? They had a just cause to start with, and they knew that. But they got carried away, and they knew that too. It is one thing to punish the evildoer. Quite another to annihilate an entire tribe of people. So, the people swung from one extreme to the other. Benjamin had been defeated. They had vowed that night on the eve of battle in a fervor of patriotism never to give one of their daughters to a Benjamite in marriage. But now all the Benjamite women were dead, and only 600 men survived. How could they, how would they now save the tribe of Benjamin from extinction? How many times in history hasn't that strange turn of events occurred? After our Civil War also came the period of Reconstruction. We called the Russians our gallant allies during the Second World War. And immediately after, they became the ruthless Reds. No sooner was that armistice signed than America did everything possible to rebuild the European cities. 
that they destroyed with saturation bombs. And after the war, the Japanese people were humbled into submission by atomic attack. We did everything possible to stand them up on their feet again. And so here, the victors were swinging from wild revenge to remorse, from anger against Benjamin to hurt over its demise, from ruination of the tribe to restoration of it. Imagine, from God's viewpoint and looking on, what a pathetic picture we on this planet must present insane and inexcusable. Why would you try to beat down somebody if you're going to next try to stand them up? There is no sense in that. Why wound them if the next thing you're going to do is heal him? And then with a cure that's going to create more problems than you had to start with. Yet that is what happened here. It is what still happened. Did you notice? It came to them at the house of God in Bethel. There at Bethel, they saw what they did not see on the field of battle. But that is always true to life. It is here in the house of God that we get a perspective on things that we don't get any place else. And are given a glimpse to see things just for a moment the way God would have us see them. And in our brothers and sisters, men and women made in the image of God, it is here in our Bethel, the house of our God, that we can catch something of our infinite preciousness to him, of the unfathomable, immeasurable love of God for us in Christ, still helping us, still healing us, and still saving us. One is today missing, they said. Noticing the gaping hole in their ranks. A people were once four square. Twelve tribes standing three on our side. And now no more. One of us is missing today. How many times haven't those words been spoken in a church? Home. A family. Why is my son missing today? My daughter, my husband. Why is the one no longer with us to sing the grand old hymns of faith and bow their heads with us in the familiar prayer? Or do you no longer inquire about the one? Or even care about just one, only one? Christ Jesus taught us in precept and parable the importance of the one, the littlest one, the last one, the least one, the lost one. The holes, the gapping breaks, the breaches, the wounds appear in the lives of every people, every family, Every individual. You can say they shouldn't happen, but they do, and it shouldn't surprise you. Nor should it defeat you or disillusion you or cause us to despair one of another, to give up on, abandon, quit on one another. Certainly. There are holes that must be repaired. 
But how and where do we begin? How shall we mend the fences that we have so heedlessly broken? And heal the many hearts that we have bruised and the wounds that we have opened in our own lives and in the lives of those about us. The text tells you this. It came to pass on the morrow that the people rose early and built there an altar and offer burnt offerings and peace offerings to God. That's where you begin. With God. It's easy to tear a thing down. A tall building can be brought down in one day. But you don't build one in a day, nor a life, nor a home, nor a marriage, nor a church, nor a country. Begins with the individual, with your right relationship to God and with mine. How, how else shall you and I ever heal others when we ourselves are still sin sick? Or speak of mercy to others when our own hearts are hard and unforgiven? Or point the way to our friends when we have lost our own bearing. How shall we promote peace and harmony in our own middle circle when our own spirits are angry and anxious and restless? Grace and goodness, compassion and mercy are God's gifts from Him to us. We must first receive them. We shall ever use them or share them. This 4th of July marks the bicentennial of the Constitution of the United States of America. In many ways, it is a most remarkable document. Not perfect, as the years have shown but surpassing anything else that has come down the pike. We are asked, when was the last time we read the thing? Or how many of us have never even read it at all? But to us, such matters are secondary. Our blessings, you see, do not originate from a legal document or from the balance of political power. God has given us his charter for our lives. The blueprint that is in the Bible. And something of the spirit of Jesus Christ to ensure our well-being. If it is true, as the Bible teaches, righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people then it is fitting that we turn to God on this national holiday and once more pray. Our Father, God to thee, offer of liberty and be received. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. Amen.